have one special thing that we would like to do before we start the panel. Um, as this is my first year as the executive director of HIF, and when I met with our feature competitions jury, which is a big deal at a film festival, they were asking me about some of the changes that I saw at the film festival. And we talked a lot about films that really have a lot of potential um, to do things in society. And this film, I Am Evidence, was unanimously decided as having the most potential to affect change out of the films that we saw come through HIF this year. So with that said, the HIF special jury would like to present Mariska Hargate and I Am Evidence co-directors Gita Ganbir and Trish Adlasek with a special jury award for impact in filmmaking. This award is given in recognition of the filmmaking team's work on I Am Evidence, their ongoing efforts in advocating for survivors, amplifying the voices of these women, and to bring each unsolved backlog case closer to justice. So, to Ms. Adlisek as co-director of I Am Evidence, congratulations and thank you. And to Ms. Hargate, as founder and president of the Joyful Heart Foundation and producer of I Am Evidence, congratulations and thank you. Again, special thanks to Joyful Heart Foundation to bringing this film and this panel to the Hawaii International Film Festival. Um, now I would like to bring up Malika Lincoln, Hawaii News Now anchor. Aloha, I'm Mileka Lincoln with Hawaii News Now and a um, huge, huge supporter and fan, I guess is a way that you could also say it, of uh, the Joyful Heart Foundation, which is actually what brings me here today. I'm extremely humbled and honored to be your moderator for tonight's panel discussion on what we know, especially for those of you who've just seen I Am Evidence for the first time is a critical issue. Um, we're gonna invite several guests um, who join us, not just nationally, but also locally as well, to talk about what the current situation is um, across the country and also right here in our own backyard, in our own community. So the hope is that when you leave here tonight, every ounce of your na'au and being an entire soul will feel so activated by what you each individually can do to make a huge difference in this issue, and, and not just making sure that rape kits get tested, but also ending sexual assault, domestic violence, and child abuse in our community and really across the country. And we're gonna activate that within all of you tonight. And I just wanna again mention that if anyone would like to at this point excuse themselves to seek any of the support services that we have provided now that you've seen the film, um, or you can certainly do so at any point during our discussion, but at this time we would like to invite up our panelists. And so um, as they go ahead and take a seat, and we're gonna try to make this as conversational as possible. Um, so I'll actually probably sit in the middle because I found that that kind of helps in these situations, making it feel a little bit more like a round table discussion. I do have a couple questions just to start us off this evening. And then of course, we'll take questions from the audience as well. So we want you guys to feel as engaged in this process as possible. So on that note, let me please invite to sit down Mariska Hargate, founder and president of the Joyful Heart Foundation and producer of I Am Evidence. <laughs> Miley Zambudo, CEO of Joyful Heart Foundation and executive producer of I Am Evidence. 
Trish Adlisek, co-director of I Am Evidence. Justin Collar, one of our Kauai prosecutors. Dale Ross, a Hawaii Island first deputy prosecuting attorney. And Representative Linda Ichiyama of the Hawaii State Legislature. Let me just triple, triple check. Can everyone hear us okay? Yes, audio's good. You need a little bit more in the back? I don't know if we can maybe turn up the mics a little bit so that people just don't feel like they're shouting, but if we can, that'd be great. We'll do a quick check, check, check. Is that a little bit better? Can you guys hear in the very back row? All right, we'll make sure that we ask everyone to speak directly into their microphone. Um, I would like to start uh, with one of our award recipients <laughs> this evening. Um, Mariska Hargitay, for those of you who obviously recognize her um, from her many years of extraordinary acting, and actually I'm gonna ask her to talk a little bit as she talked in the movie about how her role with SVU has really sort of dictated um, how she has really become this huge advocate for societal change all over the country. Um, but Mariska has been uh, the founder of the Joyful Heart Foundation, which you guys might not know was actually started right here in Hawaii. So if we can open things up, just Mariska, a little bit about your journey, if that's okay, and then we can talk about how it dovetailed into the creation of this documentary. Uh, first, first of all, welcome and thank you for coming. And uh, I'm incredibly honored to be here. So thank you, Malika. Um, I started in uh, 1999 on SVU and didn't know too much about uh, sexual assault and domestic violence um, when I started the show. So um, I tried to educate myself and uh, learn the statistics and was um, pretty devastated and floored by the statistics of sexual assault, and domestic violence and child abuse and how incredibly prevalent uh, they are. <coughs> And um, at, as soon as the show uh, got a little bit of success, I started receiving letters, as you saw in the movie, from um, victims and survivors uh, disclosing their stories of abuse to me. And I didn't understand why everyone wasn't uh, talking about this and uh, was sort of so grateful to be on a show that was uh, shedding light on these issues and um, taking these subjects that people understandably were shying away from because of shame and isolation and of course the blame being on the wrong person. And uh, in the letters that I got, they were all about shame and isolation. And so um, Joyful Heart Foundation was born here um, to shine a light on that. And uh, this is a very obviously nobody knows better in this room than all of you what a sacred and healing place this was but so many people um, I, I've had the privilege of being the person that people have shared their stories with and that has uh, deeply affected me and uh, my um, outrage at the statistics and then of course uh, learning about the rape kit backlog uh, are what inspired me to uh, do this work. So I think that um, outrage can be, if channeled properly, can be a very um, effective tool for change. So here we are. I don't, many of you know my story and I know I spoke about it in the film, but. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariska. I think it helps to understand sort of Mariska's connection um, because I think so often you may become aware of people who have incredible platforms like Mariska has, um, and, and they utilize their voice um, it, you know, for many different reasons, in many different ways. Um, but with Mariska's personal sort of tie to this advocacy as it came out of this role, but truly as it really has impacted every part of her real life, I, I hope that that's part of what you guys consider when you think that each one of you can make a difference. 
And so in the founding of the Joyful Heart Foundation um, and with the intention of the mission to provide healing and support and resources for survivors, really what started out as sort of this embrace of aloha that was born here in Hawaii, it has taken on now this uh, opportunity to advocate for reform, and so we'll talk about that. But at this point, I would like to bring in Miley to talk a little bit about how the Joyful Heart Foundation has made that shift. And maybe you can start first with, for those in our audience who might not know about the mission that the Joyful Heart has taken on, how that mission, as I had mentioned, has sort of dovetailed, springboarded into taking on something like ending the backlog. I also want to thank everyone for being here. Um, and thank you for the festival for recognizing Trish and Mariska and Gita. I'm so proud of you. Um, so Mariska founded the foundation here. Our mission is to transform society's response to the issues of domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse to support survivors' healing <laughs> and to end this violence forever. Mariska's vision when she started Joyful Heart was to help survivors heal and reclaim their lives. And since that time, we've expanded our work beyond healing directly for survivors and also the professionals who help them, called Heal the Healers, but also through education. So much of the context in which something like the, the rape kit backlog happens is in a culture. And we have a rape culture in this country. And so our education work really seeks to break down the shame and stigma that survivors feel to educate the public about these issues, to shine a light on it. Um, and given Mariska's position and access, uh, we do that very successfully. Um, and the, the newest part of our work, we've been doing it for almost eight years, is our policy work. And our sole focus and the heart of that work is the rape kit backlog. Um, we first got involved when Human Rights Watch uncovered 12,662 kits in Los Angeles. It's where I went to college. It's Mariska's hometown. Um, that's how we learned about it. We immediately got involved um, to help raise funds in LA to test the kits, private funds and public funds. Uh, in 2010, you saw Mariska had the privilege of testifying before Congress on the rape kit backlog. Two people down from her was Kim Worthy. She had just found the 11,000 kits. I think three weeks later, I was in Detroit and Mariska said, go and we're doing this. Um, at that time, there it was this sort of movement of, of rape kit reform was just starting after New York and we've done a tremendous amount in a short time. We started endthebacklog.org. If you haven't been there, please go there. It's really the, the online portal and place that everybody uses to find out about the backlog. Uh, Mershka has testified before Congress a number of times. We started the accountability project. One of the biggest issues with the backlog is that we don't know the true nature and extent of it because as you heard Kim say, kids aren't tracked in this country in any, in any way. Uh, so the accountability project is a team of pro bono, pro bono attorneys who are working every day around the country uh, through FOIA requests to get information to populate our map. So imagine the federal government's not doing this, a tiny foundation with 20 staff and a team of pro bono lawyers are trying to count and populate a map. Uh, we've also done extensive research on what's called victim notification. You saw in the film someone getting notifying with a knock on the door. We spent two years and with um, a University of Long Beach doing research to better inform jurisdictions about what the most uh, survivor-centric and compassionate way to make those notifications are to create best practices. And most recently, and probably most significantly, what we've done is help to uh, provide funding through our efforts, our advocacy efforts. So we, um, we asked and received support from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office three years ago to get the first investment of $38 million in bank forfeiture funds. We then used that to compel the federal government to create a federal grant program, which they did. So Mariska and the Vice President and the Attorney General um, and Cy Vance made an announcement of the largest single investment of $121 million. That federal grant program continues today since then uh, three times, 41 million the first time, 45 the last two years, and Hawaii has received two million um, of those funds. So it's just sort of a slice of what we did on the backlog. Um, and even though we've had all this success, uh, I think at the foundation we've, we've always <laughs> asked ourselves, what's our waiting for Superman moment? Um, and then I think coupled with the complexity uh, of the rape kit backlog, uh, it's not a simple issue, but it's a very concrete issue. 
we felt like this was something that really needed attention and needed this sort of platform and so set out about four years ago um, and brought Trish on and have been at it since, so. Wow, let's have a round of applause for the millions of dollars that have already been raised as you heard through both private and public partnerships. And really because Joyful Heart was activated, they were activated by the letters that were sent to Marishka that led to the creation of the foundation. They were activated by realizing that there was so much more that they could do than just reach out to survivors and offer them hope, offer them healing. Then on top of that, realize that the people who were assisting them also needed that level of support and resources. And that was when they realized that these are individuals that we could be helping by taking another route at this as well, right? Creating sort of this lay, this, this encircled support system and really just trying to end the cycle. And then we stumble upon these statistics coming out of LA. We'll talk a little bit more about our local statistics as well. But I think one of the most striking things for me, Trish, if we can bring you into the conversation now, was the very first time I saw the documentary, the moment Erica said, I am evidence, in the first few minutes of the film. I actually was taking notes and it was like underlined in caps and yawks and you know, um, because I wanted to know if that was where the title had organically come from, if that was already her own experience to describe it in that way. When you start to think about numbers and the numbers are staggering at this point, we think upwards of 200,000, but really we don't know and we'll talk about why we don't know um, what we know about how kids are collected and unfortunately how they're shelved, but for her to be an individual in that number and to be able to define her own experience in such a way. Um, I'd like for you, if you can share with our audience the fact that there were four incredible survivors that were featured in this film, but you actually interfaced and engaged with 14 women who I know have all sort of become Ohana family of sorts through this process that you guys still keep in touch with. When did their experiences become an individual experience for you as well? and not just a number for a rape kit on a shelf? Really good questions. If I may just, before I answer, I, I'd like to acknowledge some additional folks who've helped us get here. There's one very special one in the audience, Lauren Bromley, our executive producer. She was extraordinary in her here today. In addition to all of the work Joyful Heart has done, I'd like to thank HBO for taking the film on. It's a t really tough subject matter, but they have celebrated us, and they, we can't wait for it to broadcast in the spring. And Gita could not be here. And um, we're also grateful for, for everyone's support. Um, and to answer your question, um, it, it was, um, there was another title floating around. Um, during the making, and it was a title that made me a little uneasy because, um, as a filmmaker, it was a title that it was like almost like a like a jinx word for filmmakers. <laughs> but I, I but um, but I said, okay, we're going to keep going, we're going to explore, explore. And then I was no, knowing that we were featuring um, Detroit in the film, and I'm realizing that Detroit was 83 percent African American. Um, I really wanted to find um, a center that catered to the needs of African American women, and I found one, and it was called the it's called the Sasha Center, yeah. and you saw the woman Kalima. She she was the she's the director of that organization, and I asked her. I was looking to see if we could find someone who hadn't yet had their kit tested and was part of the Detroit backlog, so we could follow that arc in the film to see what it would be like if we could locate it if it would be tested, if there would be a trial, how would it be for the survivor to experience that journey? So Kalima said, I think we might have someone for you. Why don't you come to the center? I went to the center and um, this beautiful woman walked in the room and had this great pink hair and she was wearing a t-shirt that said, I am evidence. And I immediately got chills and I realized I was about to have a profound experience and I didn't even know what she was about to tell me, but there was something about those words um, that sort of put it all into one phrase that really um, added it all up for me. And when she shared, what I especially loved was the fact that it meant two things. One is that, yes, we are living, breathing crime scenes, but also that um, we can heal, 
that we don't have to be our circumstance, that we can grow. And I thought that was a really hopeful message. And um, when I uh, finished the interview, I immediately called Mershka and Miley, and I said, I think we have our title. I hope you like it. <laughs> and, and it came, that's the organic way in which when you make, you know, when I started working on this, people would say, do you have a script? And I was like, no, I wish I did. <laughs> you know, because it's so much harder when you don't. And it was like, oh, where do I go? Who do I talk to? How do I put this together? And so um, that moment was, it was such a eureka moment because it, it helped us also to say, okay, we're finding the voice for the film now. Now we have legs. Now we're moving. And um, yes, there were 14 women, all of which really wanted to be interviewed. They were, one, so relieved that someone wanted to hear their stories after going through this horrific violence and then being re-victimized by the very entities that were set up to support them. They were so disappointed and had been waiting so long and they couldn't believe that we were actually making the film. You know, the fact that we were making the film alone gave them so much hope uh, and, and for a future, a better future for other survivors. Um, and so um, it was very difficult to, to pick the final four, but what we really wanted to do was to um, have the voices in the cities that were different phases of the issue. So where Cleveland had a fully funded, uh, politically aligned Republican attorney general aligned with a Democratic prosecutor <coughs> fully funding this very important public safety issue and really giving it the care it needed. Uh, contrasted with Detroit where Kim Worthy was struggling and not getting any economic support or moral support really from her county executive to what went wrong in LA? Why were there only six convictions? When we tested nearly 11,000 kids, uh, it seemed odd. And so it was a look at various phases of the issue and how it was being dealt with. And so, um, but the, everyone is really pleased to have participated and um, they're all doing pretty well right now, which is so um, exciting. And also just to say that the, I noticed personally transformative effects by have, when they were interviewed, like I kept in touch with all of them, and each one of their lives seemed to have gotten better. They've lifted this burden, and um, all of their stories helped us find the voice for the movie. So each one of their stories mattered so greatly to us all. I love that, that idea that they are not just evidence in you know the literal sense of what is collected from their bodies and we'll talk about what it means to have to go through a sex assault exam, um, but also that they're evidence of the survivorship in the end. That's really, that's really wonderful. I know um, there's gonna be questions later about where folks can get t-shirts. So we'll let you guys sort of simmer on that. Um, at this point, I would like to bring in sort of our legislative arm of the conversation. Um, and, and before we do that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about just very briefly what my experience as a reporter covering this locally has been like and the challenge um, with that. At the very end of the film when you see the sort of 200,000 ticker clicking and really this sort of and counting kind of to be continued dot 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 um, it's not just because it makes for a great follow-up and we know we're gonna wanna have a great follow-up to I Am Evidence at some point um, but it's because it's the reality. I know. They're like, what? We did not discuss that. <laughs> yeah. um, it's because we really don't know. And I know for a fact that we really don't know. Because as a reporter here in Hawaii trying to cover the issue of our own untested rape kits, it has been impossible for me to get a concrete number from anyone about really three basic things that should be very easy for any police department to tell me. How many rape kits have been collected? How many rape kits have been tested? And how many rape kits are still sitting on a shelf? And I know that those questions might even seem a little bit redundant, but it's because there are tests that unfortunately don't happen even though kits are collected because of terminology that gets floated around like unfounded, and we'll talk about that. We'll talk about real rape and righteous victims in just a minute. But there are also kids that we know end up getting destroyed. And regardless of whether or not a statute of limitations has expired, what we're gonna talk about is sort of a legislative push 
that would create comprehensive reform in every single state across the country that would create such a universal standard upon which we address and handle this particular type of crime that once we take care of this, then we can start knocking off other things, you know? But, but it's so simple and it comes down to six pillars and so sort of to introduce the legislative and prosecutorial aspect of this, I'm gonna actually bring Miley back in first to talk about what the joyful heart through years and years of research and countless hours of just individuals committed to determining what the best practices would be from a legislative perspective in order to guide practices in each county and each state, um, what those six pillars are. And then we'll talk about why they're not happening here in Hawaii. Um, so just for perspective, when Mariska um, testified in 2010, there was one state in the country that had any sort of legislative reform in terms of rape kits, and it was Illinois. Um, and today there are 32 states who've passed some sort of reform. So it's ho that's very hopeful to me and represents progress. Um, and still, there are only eight states that mandate testing of backlog of, of past kits or future kits. Um, and for us, we really, we had sort of been somewhat um, puzzled whether to, f to focus at, on the federal level or at the state level. And so we focused our efforts from a funding perspective at the federal level, but really dug in in terms of reform on the states. And we knew that we needed a plan. So we turned to a group of brilliant people at a group called Civitas Public Affairs who really created and designed um, the road, the, the blueprint for um, marriage equality and had worked on that with that blueprint for 12 years. And they uh, unanimously agreed to take us on and over a one year period did over 100 interviews across the country to come up with what we call the six pillars of comprehensive reform. And last year we launched a campaign to pass comprehensive reform in all 50 states by 2020. Um, and the six, six pillars are first to audit, to have a, an audit every year, an annual audit, to be transparent and count the number of kits that you have. Um, the second is to test all backlogged kits that are tied to a reported sexual assault. So where a victim has, through their agency, given consent. Uh, the second is to test all kits that come in tied to a reported sexual assault. So to eliminate any discretion in the system, but to mandate the testing of all kits. The next is tracking. You saw how uh, those, the big books in Detroit um, in the comment about Amazon, very simple to implement tracking systems. Why is actually making great progress on that. But it's very important in, in order to gather the data that you want to gather. Um, but also to give victims um, access to information, which is the fifth pillar, which is a victim's right to notice. Right now, victims do not have a legal right to know the status <coughs> of their cases and their kits. And so we need to legislate that. And the final is funding. Um, and you know it's so important that law enforcement and these systems um, have the resources that they need to do their jobs um, and have ongoing resources so that we can do this properly because it is one factor um, that's part of this. So in terms of comprehensive reform, there is one state in the country that we passed all six pillars this year. Anybody guess what state? Texas. <laughs> Crazy, right? Um, Anyone who's lived in Texas knows how yeah. horrible that is. Uh, but we did introduce over 70 pieces of legislation in 33 states. We passed 16 um, uh, bills, so we were very proud. Um, and just in terms of the local context of the six pillars, um, Hawaii, I would say, generously has two. We have done a state uh, legislative a state uh, audit, but it's one, it was a one-time audit. Um, and in terms of funding, there is funding. There's a $2 million SACI grant program for the federal government, as well as $500,000 for testing on the neighbor islands. Uh, but we'd like that beefed up to secure even more funding um, and to sure that up on a permanent basis. So, and in terms of the six pillars, the other thing that really holds up those six pillars is that this year, the National Institute of Justice, which is the research arm of the Department of Justice, put out um, standards and best practices about um, sexual assault response in this country, uh, which are 100% consistent with our pillars. So that's the goal.
seems so simple. I mean, six easy steps. And so at this point, I'd like to bring in Representative Linda Ichiyama. Um, as you know, a uh, member of the Women's Caucus within our Hawaii State Legislature, um, who really, after you guys had heard about the reported untested rape kits that were at least within the Honolulu Police Department, because that was sort of the first snapshot that we had, that there was roughly 1,900 of these rape kits that were sitting untested. When you think about how small of, of a state we are, um, 1,900 with the possibility that maybe there's an additional potentially 750 combining all of the neighbor islands as well, this is certainly a tackable thing. We can absolutely make sure that we get the funding that's needed to test every single one of our kits. And so we'll talk about that. But Representative Linda Ichiyama sat on the Women's Caucus and when they heard what was happening, they immediately sprung into action, um, which is not always how things work at the state capitol. <laughs> and I can make that joke because I covered the ledge for so many years. But um, Linda, we'd like to bring you in to talk about what it was specifically that encouraged you guys to take action in such an aggressive, at least you know, step initially, to create the act which is now law requiring at least this initial audit, so this initial report to try to bring everyone sort of onto the same playing field with what are the numbers in terms of what have been collected, what have been tested, and what are still waiting. What was it that you guys were trying to accomplish with that? And then at that point, we'd like to speak sort of from the prosecuting perspective of it. So um, I think this, this really was a national thing first. Um, I think a lot of us didn't want to think that this could happen in Hawaii that you know why you know why would why would we have kits that aren't tested here of course they should be tested um and so we actually had passed a resolution um i think it was like 2012 2013 um uh requesting an inquiry and a report um but we didn't get anything back from that and then as the the movement was um happening on the mainland you, um and the stories that came forward i think that was really the momentum the survivor stories um and so the Women's Legislative Caucus uh, made this one of our priority issues in 2015 and 2016. Um, in 2016, we worked on legislation to require the audit of all uh, kits in the possession of law enforcement and required the Attorney General to convene a working group. Um, at first, the bill had started out with a mandate to test all kits. Um, but as we were working through session, we realized that was not going to be achievable because just like Maleka said, there was just so much information and inconsistencies. inconsistencies. Um, we didn't have enough information. Um, and so with the help of Joyful Heart Foundation um, and their executive director here, Kate, sorry, um, we uh, instead turned it into an audit and then a working group um, to come up with recommendations on guideline for testing the untested kits and to also come up with recommendations for testing all new kits. And so that report was presented at the end of last year. Um, and then this past session, the other piece we tried to put in as one of the six pillars that Myla mentioned was uh, victim notification of rights. Um, we modeled our legislation on federal legislation um, uh, requiring victims to know that they have a right to a medical legal exam, that they have a right for it to be free, um, and they have the right to know what happens to their kid along the way. Unfortunately, it wasn't successful this past session, so we're going to try again next year. But we did pass another resolution requiring another annual audit, so that information will be coming out um, at the end of this year. Thank you very much. And that sort of dovetails now into where we find ourselves, because um, as the film touched on, this isn't just an issue of untested rape kits that sit in a backlog. There becomes also an investigation, prosecutorial, essentially conviction backlog that is created by what we have sort of allowed to happen in giving departments, essentially giving police officers the discretion to decide what reported rape kits actually get forwarded along to a prosecutor's office. And then from a prosecution standpoint, of course, understanding that there are some cases that may or may not be stronger than others. Um, but so I'd like to give you guys an opportunity to sort of talk about, from a local perspective, just um, your sense of what we saw in the film, sort of this righteous victim and real rape sort of terminology that was used to describe what we know are, are stranger attacks, which we also know are statistically incredibly low 
compared to acquaintance sexual assault, which we know is statistically incredibly high. Um, and, and what you guys are doing from a Kauai and Hawaii Island perspective um, to try to sort of, again, level the playing field. Do you guys come from um, a point of view where you believe that all rape kits should not have the discretion of a police officer, but should be tested so that you guys then have all the information you need to move forward? Um, to answer that question, uh, yes, I do believe all the kits should be tested within, uh, to, to the extent that they can serve any potential uh, evidentiary purpose. And I think that law enforcement, generally speaking, um, has come to the point where, where they accept that. And it's been, it's been kind of an evolutionary process over a number of years, I think. You know, the uh, police departments in Hawaii started collecting uh, rape kit evidence in 1992 in Honolulu, and then uh, by 2001, 2002, the neighbor islands as well were doing it. And at that time, the way police and prosecutors thought of that evidence is that you're using it as evidence in this one case to tie a, per, a particular perpetrator to a particular offense. And so if there was a situation where the suspect admitted that they had had sex, but it was consensual, the investigator might think, well, then there's no purpose in sending this out for analysis because we already have the ID of the suspect established. Uh, so, so there were situations like that. And then over the years, it became apparent as things like DNA testing became more sophisticated and more commonly accepted in law enforcement which was really only in the 1980s, 1990s that that started to happen. And then the CODIS database came into existence and law enforcement began to understand that this could be evidence not just of one situation, but this, this could be evidence that could tie a number of cases together. And so that helped the evolution of the thinking over the years, I think. Um, I can tell you that... Sure. You know, I've been affiliated with law enforcement on Kauai for about 10 years, and I've been serving as the elected prosecutor for about five years. And just in the time that I've been around, I've seen the evolution in the way that the police handle the program, um, in, in the way they do adhere to best practices in terms of making sure that um, the victims are offered the testing, that the testing is done in a compassionate way, in a compassionate location, that the victims are provided with the support that they need to um, feel like they can have confidence in law enforcement that we're going to honor what they've been through and treat them with respect. So, you know, that's, it's, been a, it's been a process in Hawaii, I think, um, to gain the trust that we are going to do what is the right thing with this evidence and that we're going to move it forward in an ethical and meaningful manner. So um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what the numbers show for Hawaii in terms of the connections that we're able to make and the evidentiary value that these test results are going to bring to uh, concrete criminal prosecutions. Uh, there's a lot of follow-up work that has to be done between, you know, our project in Hawaii is really in its infancy. So it's, it's exciting. It's got a lot of potential. And I, I know a lot of us in law enforcement, I won't speak for Dale, but I think we agree that we're really looking forward to seeing where this is going to go. And I do want to just thank everybody here for using their platform to help bring this to uh, the stage that it's at, including the Women's Legislative Caucus, because they are a caucus that can get things done when they decide to get things done. So we're, we've seen that over and over again, and I'm very grateful for what they do. <laughs> and, and A.G. Chin and his team for, for moving the SAKI uh, program forward in Hawaii. They're not just giving it lip service. They are moving it forward aggressively. And so, uh, and then Marishka and uh, Miley and everyone who made this film a reality. And, and Mileka, you in the media too, because we all are pushing from different sides on, on this you know, elephant trying to make it move. And once in a while we hit the right spot and it moves. So. That's an important thing. Dale, if you can weigh in as well from yeah. just the Hawaii Island perspective, and okay. again, sort of the initial kind of question um, to segue to is, do you believe that police departments should have the discretion on which rape kits get tested and well, which do not? Um, I agree with what Justin said about that point, and I think that you have consensus on that. Um, I want to thank everybody here, too. Um, I want to 
just I learned a lot by watching the movie about the story behind all this movement. Um, I became a member of the statewide um, committee, and we have several members here today. Um, and I don't know if they saw the movie before, but I'm really proud of the um, efforts that have been made thanks to the legislation, Act 207 in 2016. Um, the numbers that you're asking about are in the December 2016 report and you have a breakdown of every um, county's numbers of kits that were collected, kits that were unsubmitted for testing. And um, thus far, the total number was 1951 kits that were um, not submitted for testing. And at this point, I think we have like a little over 1,100 kits that have been submitted for testing. So we're making progress and I'm really proud of all the hard work and we thank the Attorney General's um, team for um, pushing us together. Some of those meetings were excruciating. <laughs> um, but we came together and we um, determined what we meant when we said what we were saying, um, what how we were going to report it. We read about Detroit. I read about Detroit's program, all the problems in Cleveland and to see the faces now through this movie has been just incredible. So thank you for that. Um, I think that with the uh, uh, um, ongoing legislative push to have more numbers reported and um, hopefully more funding then to continue because some of my concerns include funding for this year's kits, for example, um, the ongoing need for funding. We have. Um, on the neighbor islands used Act 207 monies to fund the backlog and last year, last year fiscal year's kits. But we still have a need to fund this year's fiscal um, year's kits. And of course, you know, it's going to be an ongoing thing. Um, everyone agreed to the extension of time um, for which we would be collecting kits from 72 hours to 120 hours. So that's going to be additional kits that will be collected. And that's a big that's a big movement. We don't want to sort of gloss over that. So that, that changes the window of reporting opportunity for a woman who, as you mentioned, could potentially be experiencing trauma that results in paralysis, who may not find herself in a position to get support from people around her or to have her own strength to go into an area um, where she can self-report and then have an SAE done. Um, but that window now has been extended uh, and that's huge and that's just based right. on advances in and technology. and Right, and then there's always technology, right, that's improving our ability to get um, DNA evidence um, perhaps at the scene or even earlier at the police stations and that can assist with reducing the backlog at a lab, right? Um, I just wanted to say one more thing about kits and the backlog kits because um, I've been a prosecutor for 30 years so I know the significance of these kits was not just for the DNA ID evidence but it was also, as Justin explained, you know, so like if you had a situation involving a known perpetrator, you didn't see the value of submitting that kit for testing because the identification of the perpetrator was known. But the value of, those kits were collected in a medical forensic examination. And during those examinations, um, the victim's medical needs were also <coughs> examined and looked at. And, so evidence of injury, for example, could come arise out of a forensic medical examination. And prosecutors proceeded on those cases where there was evidence of injury, for example, without the DNA test being done. And so you have instances where um, you didn't necessarily get the testing done, but the case proceeded. And so we have um, situations like that in Hawaii as well. Um, it's important because one of the things that we learned from the film and also in research is that um, there are serial offenders. So while not every male amongst us is a sexual offender, right, for those that are, they're statistically more likely to offend more than once. And in the case of Courtney, who got caught because he raped his wife, and that's why his DNA was in CODIS. I mean, that alone should be sort of every 
everything you need to know about why every kit should be tested regardless of if that person claims it was consensual or not because right. if it goes back to another attack right you won't know if you don't test and the I kit. think if you read some of the studies now not only are they connected serial offenders with other rapes but um, other kinds of offenses as well you know so it's not just it's not just um, serial sexual offenders but you're talking about people who have criminal thinking right. and they um, perpetrate crimes all kinds of crimes against other people um, and it's important to know their identification so regardless of whether or not the statute of limitations has expired regardless of whether or not it was a consensual relationship I think it's important that these kids be tested Thank you. We'd like to invite anyone who has a question from the audience to go ahead and make a single file line over here if you can. We want to try to get to as many of your questions as possible. We'll make sure that you guys get a mic. And then if, if you can just let you know whomever on the panel it is you'd like to respond to the question. We'll try to put a mic on each side if we can. Um, because we want to give you guys an opportunity um, to weigh in as well. Uh, first off, thank you guys so much for everything you've done. Um, back uh, six months ago, I was actually talking with Bree about this at Bloomingdale's, and I've come up with a concept of, have you guys ever thought about going after, uh, you're going legislation, you're going federal, <coughs> excuse me, but in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, there was a case where women were actually uh, successfully able to go after the state's because they are having their constitutional rights to equal protection violated. Sorry, I had a cold. <coughs> so has that been a concept where you can think about that to go after it from that point of view? I just, just to be clear, are you saying um, when they're d pursuing civil uh, lawsuits in their individual states? Uh, that was one uh, okay. uh, concept that I had thought about, you know, uh, I, I joke around, I call it, I don't joke around, but I call it the uh, never ending story concept. But to be able to successfully sue the county, the state, mm -hmm. everything going from there, because they have a, what was it, 30 days requirement once the uh, rape kit is processed. They have 30 days to have it tested. So it not being tested in that frame of time, mm -hmm. they have to, they have that ability to actually say, my constitutional rights were violated, I'm going to sue. Yeah. It really depends state to state, and it's also very difficult to sue municipalities. There are key time frames, and you have to prove gender discrimination often. Um, they, we did capture the first rape kit settlement in the United States. It was in Harvey, Illinois. It was very successful. Um, uh, there were 13 plaintiffs, and the principal plaintiff got the largest award because she was a minor at the time of her assault. So the statutes and the minor case played a different role. Um, but there are uh, cases around the country where there is some pursuit of that. Um, they're difficult cases, but they, they are being heard. And that it's another way for a survivor to feel, you know, they can pursue justice. And it's also a way to fix the problem. Uh, it's not the only way, but um, in the case of Harvey, part of the settlement included significant changes in the way in which the police department receive cases, process cases, and kids. So um, uh, in that regard, uh, it was effective in that case in Harvey, Illinois. That, uh, fantastic. Yes, uh, I Bree, I don't know if you remember or not when you and I were talking about it at Bloomingdale's during the Hawaii Says No More event, uh, women actually being able to successfully sue their attacker in civil court and finding a way to enter in the rape kit to that particular evidence. You know, he may not go to prison, but at the very least that survivor will have that uh, opportunity to say, you know what, I pointed you out, I said you did this to me. Win or lose, win, lose or draw, you know, monetary damages, uh, pain and suffering, anything like that, you know, the punitive damages aspect of it. Not saying it's gonna be successful, but it's that, you know, I call it the grain of sand, you know, at the end of Never Ending Story, Bastion was able to rebuild Fantasia from that grain of sand. So giving that survivor that grain of sand to be able to rebuild her life from there. So possibility on that one. Have you seen any situations like that? I have read about some cases in that regard. Um, there's a chain of custody concern. You know, I mean, the prosecutors here could speak to this, uh, but you know, uh, it gets a little complicated 
uh, when you're pursuing suing the attacker because one you know you have to, it has to be proven in a criminal court to some degree right and if that case didn't work out you can pursue civil charges but you have to show what those damages are for it to be successful so it's it gets it's their hard cases um, but I have read about some of them let's take our next question um, first of all uh, uh, an acknowledgement and a thank you as a woman of color and an immigrant myself you could have taken this incredibly complicated and huge issue of the rape kit backlog and even violence against women and sex crimes and been able to educate us just in a purely clinical and institutional way, but you took on the analysis of intersectional of women of color and uh, race and class. And I commend you for that because I know how nuanced and difficult that can be, but somehow you, you were very successful in it. I think it's important to tell that story. I think it's so critical to say, why is it that um, women of color's lives don't matter as much when they're raped? And you say it out loud, and, and I'm very grateful for that. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you for saying that. Everyone's voice matters. And, and that is so important to us. I, I've been working in, in, in the violence against women's movement for many, many years, and 20 years here in Hawaii. And as a victim advocate myself, I learned so much from you know, um, doing the work with Miley and, and Joyful Heart. I can't imagine that for survivors, you know, how can we be more, how can we educate in a more transparent way? These processes, I work at the University of Education in the criminal, just, uh, criminal justice system, the university system, suing in civil court. They're so incredibly complicated, you know, when you're going through this most traumatic and invasive violent um, experience. Um, and yet, the, you know, just talking to the prosecutors is such a complicated issue. Really, to, I guess to Miley and to Representative Ichiyama, what do we see our priorities in Hawaii so to, for us to frame these issues in a way that we can have a, continue to have a real dialogue? Because I think we're just beginning. I mean, I think for us, our single focus is the six pillars, and we're sort of not going to stop until we're successful. Um, I think we've done enough research to feel very firmly rooted, um, boldly rooted, that that's the way forward and willing to do you know, everything and anything that we can um, in every state, but particularly Hawaii because it's our birthplace. Um, and because we believe that it's possible. I mean, almost every single person who we actually need besides the legislature or a representative from an agency is actually in this room right now that can get it done. And we're in Hawaii. So imagine if we could be the second state after Texas to pass comprehensive reform before California, who only has two that we just passed three weeks ago. It's possible. So that's my greatest hope. And don't you think it's possible? Yeah. Like this legislative session, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so Rep. Ichiyama, um, just to add on to what Jen had said, um, because they're cutting us off here. So I want to make sure that I can tag on this question because you're absolutely right, Miley, that so many of the right people are in this room right here, right now. So Representative, you said that last year you attempted um, let a piece of legislation that did not make it through. Can you, can you expand upon the reason for that not, not passing to the detail that, that you're privy um, and how the rest of us in this room can assist. So especially for those of us from the neighbor islands, the legislative session moves very quickly and that notice for getting testimony in is a short period of time. We want to help, but we feel helpless sometimes. And so anything that you can give us and any of you actually to help us help you, we are in this all together and we really want to see those kinds of movements pass. And so any assistance, any guidance, any mentorship, sponsorship, we'd like to help. Well, thank you very much for that question. It's a, a really great question. Um, and I think the answer is, is in this room, right here in front of us, right? All of us working together. Um, I think the, the movie that we saw is another piece of it. It's powerful. That's storytelling. And um, tomorrow, talk to your friends. Tell them about the movie that you saw. <coughs> Tell them how it made you feel. Um, call your legislators. Tell them about the movie that you saw and how it made you feel. Um, I, I, I don't want people to think that, that you can only do legislative things during the session. Um, in fact, that's sometimes the worst time to try to do things legislatively because it's so crazy and so busy. 
And so the best time really right now is to contact your legislator now. Um, send them an email, write them a letter, um, because once session hits, it's just so crazy. Now's actually a really good time. Um, you know, if you want, make an appointment with them, sit down and talk to them about this. I think that's so powerful um, when somebody says, you know, this is, this is why this matters and this is why this is important to me. Um, and I can tell you the Women's Legislative Caucus is making this a priority next session as we've done in the past few years. And I'm so grateful to the help from um, the prosecutors, the AGs, the police. You know, they've all been stakeholders um, working together with us. Um, and then thank you also to the Joyful Heart Foundation because they provided actually a lot of the techno technical expertise for us, not only legislatively, but also um, through the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative. They're part of the technical group that comes in and helps Hawaii, um, you know, make sure that we're doing all the right things. Are we, are we doing right by survivors? Are we, are we doing, um, doing what's best? And so I would just say, you know, the more you can talk about it, the better. I think that's one of the points in the movie that was really important to me is that uh, if we don't talk about it, people think that it's wrong, that they're ashamed, and they're afraid. And by talking about it, it makes it okay to talk about it more. And the more we talk about it, the more that we can have success and, and justice. If I could just add one more thing. Um, we do have a website, the Attorney General's website, that includes on there a form um, for survivors to request information on their kits. Um, we uh, looked at Portland's Rose Project and used that as a template for us to create the our um, project here. And so we hope that uh, one thing that people who watch this movie can also do and talk to their friends about is to go to Hawaii's Attorney General's website and um, look for that information. That's where you'll see the number of kits that have been submitted for testing, um, which is updated on a quarterly basis, um, as well as um, that form and other the 2016 report to the legislature, and hopefully other reports to come in the future. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's so important. If you go to endthebacklog.org, there's an interactive map, and you can find out how to send letters. There's sample scripts if you want to call. There's sample letters. It's sort of as simple as um, a click of a button. So, and I just want to echo what she said. It, that, that is what really made the difference. We just, against all odds, passed two bills in California when they had zero out of six pillars. And it was really because of a very grassroots small group of people who got on the phone, set an alarm, every 10 minutes, we had a cavalry, a group of people in the community who just called every 10 minutes. And we got these two bills passed and signed just three weeks ago. We want to thank you guys all so much again um, for being here tonight. And I know that you were all given information on Joyful Heart Foundation when you guys came in. Um, and that is an incredible, as we mentioned, resource for you guys. Um, not to put her on the spot, but I did want to give Mariska an opportunity to say one more thing if you'd like to. I think we've said it. Thank you, everybody, for your expertise and, and all that work we're doing. You know, it, it's uh, this is how we get things done is by being in this kind of room and talking about these issues. You know, I just sort of, I think the film speaks for itself and um, we're trying to give, you know, we created this survivor-centric movement to give voice to survivors and every survivor matters. And this is a movie saying that these kids on a shelf are human beings. These are lives. And so, you know, I think by not testing a kit, we're saying they don't matter. There is great power. There is great healing in, in bearing witness to someone. Everyone wants to be believed. Everyone wants to matter. So by not testing a kit, we're saying that you don't matter. And there is great healing in justice that way and for people to never have access to justice. That's a crime. Yeah. So thank you for being here. <laughs>